Hey, my name is Eitan Buckman. Uh, you're listening to another episode of Future of Freight. Really good to have everybody here. This is actually the first episode that does not have any external guests. So we've gone 13 episodes where the only Fredo speaker was myself. Uh, and, and after a while, we realized that there are some interesting insights that we're coming up with internally, particularly an annual report that we put together that we call our Mystery Shopper Report that might be really interesting to discuss. Uh, once a year and going back to uh, 2015 and, and even a little bit in 2014, we started to think if we're advocating digital freight sales, we kind of need a benchmark to understand where is the industry. So back then we created a fake company and since then we've evolved a little bit in our process, but we created a fake company and tried to get price quotes from the top 20 global freight forwarders. And it became something that we started to do every single year, year in and year out to use as a benchmark for international freight digitization and adoption. And we figured after running the last report, it might make sense to talk about it a little bit more here. Uh, so today we have uh, two of my colleagues from Freitos, uh, Tzvi Schreiber, CEO of the Freitos Group, and Judah Levine, who runs our research. Uh, Judah, Tzvi, you can unmute, turn your videos on, say hello. Hello. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Right, so, uh, you know, maybe I'll start with uh, you, Tzvi, because you pay my salary. If you, uh, you know, talk a, a minute or two about yourself and your background, just for those uh, who don't necessarily know you here. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I've had a career as a software entrepreneur, been creating, uh, got a technical background, been creating software companies. But I, I learned about this world of international shipping in 2010, 2011. I managed a company called Litec which was the only time in my career that I dealt with hardware. We, we were making electronic power supplies for LED lights. I sold that company to GE Lighting a couple of years later. Uh, but during that time, I was dealing, like like I'm sure many of the, the people on the call, I was dealing with import and export, and um, I was kind of shocked to discover quite how manual and offline and opaque that world is. Uh, and that was my inspiration to start uh, Freitos in 2012. The idea is to bring... The vision of Freitas is to bring the same conveniences that we have, say, in passenger travel to the world of international shipping. Perfect. All right. And, and Judah um, has been running the research at Freitas. I'll, I'll let you uh, introduce yourself too, Judah. Sure. Uh, my background is in market research. I've been involved in market research for uh, about eight years in one capacity or another. Um, here at Freitas, I'm the research lead. Uh, in that capacity, we do stuff about the, about the markets in general. We do a weekly uh, freight update. Um, that looks at uh, ocean and air rates and, and how those are reflecting wh whatever is uh, going on at the moment uh, in the market overall. Uh, and I also do research on uh, logistics and logistics technology. So the, the mystery shopper is, is one example of the types of uh, logistics technology research that uh, we do here. Awesome. Thanks, Judah. Thanks to me for joining. Uh, and, and for those of you listening in, my commitment in this episode especially uh, is, is that we aim to get freight digitization research and insights out um, just like every other episode. This is not a promotional episode. We'll save any promotions for the very end and I'll have a disclaimer before that. Uh, but really this is about providing the right insights. And just like every episode that we run, your participation is, is incredibly welcome. So please, if you have any questions during the course of the webinar, feel free to drop them in the Q&A. And if I like the question, I'll actually uh, ask it. So uh, jumping in just as the general context and, and how we fit into this, uh, Freightos does a lot of different things across the ecosystem. We work with freight forwarders to help them digitize their rates and bookings. We work directly with carriers to help them automate their pricing. And we work on Freightos.com as a digital freight marketplace in order to help small and mid-sized businesses compare, book, and manage their shipments. And we have another layer of data across it. And, and that really puts us in the heart and in the center of freight rate digitization, watching it very closely uh, as very interested bystanders and also working with some of the most advanced companies in the world to help them start to sell online. But I wanna take everyone here back a little bit to 2015. I, I think 2015 was the year that we had the first research done well. I had put it together in 2014, but it wasn't really, it wasn't really up to standard. 2015, we really started to nail it a little bit more. And this was the season finale of uh, Mad Men, Adele, Hamilton came out, if you've had a chance to see it. Uh, but, but more importantly on the tech side and in the tech industry, we were finally hitting this point where B2B e-commerce was taking off, right? And people like to talk about how logistics is, is backwards, but logistics had actually been one of the first data sharing industries way back in the 1970s. I think there's still a lot of room to go and, and probably everybody on the call agrees. EDI had uh, started in the 1970s. By 1995, consumer internet 
was becoming much more transactional with Amazon and eBay taking off. Dell shifted into direct online sales, representing a huge portion of their business by 1997. And in 1998, Alibaba came along. 2015, which I think really became uh, quite a watershed year, was when Amazon launched Amazon Business, really go understanding that this transformation from B2C to online sales needs to take it up a notch and needs to go after business buyers who, after all, are, are users too. So I, I kind of want to start off uh, to V, a, a question for you. If you take yourself back to 2015, or, or maybe even a couple of years before that, when Freydos was just getting started, you were looking at freight a little bit from an outsider's perspective, but also as somebody who had, who had consumed services within the industry. And, and what are the main dissonances or differences that you felt between where freight was and where B2B tech was? Yeah, I mean, if you go back to 2015, we'd already been working for three years. Um, and at that point, I mean, B2C obviously was, many aspects of B2C were, were very online, very transparent, passenger travel, retail had already for years been very transparent um, and very much based on a self-service, you know, sort of model. Um, B2B, there were aspects of that. I mean, you had, like you mentioned before, Amazon business. So, so buying supplies for the office was very online. Um, business travel was was probably very online, um, but still B2B uh, was and is, you know, lagging behind B2C. Um, but by 2015, you know, the, the survey, um, which which you guys started then, was really showing that um, the freight industry had barely started digitization. So we, we'd been harping on about this for three years by then. Um, and, and we were, you know, almost sort of talking to the wall. There was still very, very little online quoting uh, but but you know in the it's very exciting to see that in the in the five six years since then it is slowly uh, improving every year so 2015 we, we were probably still pretty <laughs> we were pretty frustrated when we uh, you know had the report and we said okay we've been working for three years we're not seeing a lot of impact yet we knew that behind the scenes we're, we're providing software we were starting to, to create maybe some of the infrastructure but it wasn't coming through to the shipper yet in 2015. And now, five or six years later, um, the report is showing that that all the work that we and others did on digitalization is starting to come all the way through to the shipper in, in more and more cases. Mm -hmm. you know, I think one, one thing that we hear a lot, uh, probably in a lot of sales calls and, and meeting with freight forwarders in the field, whenever you talk about digitization, you could bring in a different industry, say insurance is digitizing or, or finance is, is digitizing. You say freight and they'd say, no, but freight is really complicated. Uh, how do you feel when people when people respond? Do you feel like there, there's justification to that, or is that more of a cultural thing than a technology barrier? I, I think there's some truth to it. Um, now, with the power of computing nowadays, you can digitalize also a very complex industry. Uh, but but it's true that that freight has many many moving parts, very very um, fragmented. You know, many many different companies involved in every transaction and that there are hundreds of carriers and, and hundreds of thousands of trucking carriers, hundreds of ocean and air carriers, um, a hundred thousand freight forwarders uh, and none of the history, you know, somehow, I don't know why, but passenger travel, you know, Sabre started, I, I often quote this in the 1960s. So they started some kind of data infrastructure since the, you know, for, for already 60 years in passenger travel and in freight, that was never the case. Um, so, so I think there's certainly truth to the, to the fact that this is a complex industry, many details, many players. Having said that, you know, <laughs> it's 2021. I mean, with cloud computing, with AI, it's quite possible to digital, digitalize complex industries as well. Do you feel like maybe there's a chance, you know, there could probably be a couple of different culprits for flagging, for flagging digitization I think things will always digitize faster if there's strong demand for it. So one culprit could be importers simply don't need it or don't demand it you know, that much. Another could be that the underlying data infrastructure, like the carriers themselves are not digitized. Do you think there's any one kind of primary culprit that, that, that prevented that type of digitization? I think, um, I, I don't want to say there's one culprit, but but I think it's a lot about the uh, our friends, the freight forwarders, our friends and customers. And that's why we've we spent a lot of our effort working with freight forwarders, uh, because that's where it comes together. Now, uh, undoubtedly, there is an issue that some of the shippers are, are old school. 
and weren't demanding it, but other ones, of course, were, especially in e-commerce. There, you know, there's t- tend to be pe- people who are very uh, online savvy. Mm-hmm. So there's some some um, liability with the um, shippers and some with the carriers. Um, many of them didn't have an API, and everything starts with the carriers. You can't ship stuff without carriers. Uh, so that's certainly true. But in the end, it's the freight forwarders who, who tend to pull together the quotes, and that's where they need to have the desire and the technology. Uh, and the discipline to actually manage their rates uh, globally and 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 produce uh, price quotes in an automated way, uh, and and that's tough, especially because for various reasons that often the different countries, even in a global freight forwarder, you know, if you're a local freight forwarder, that then you, you're dependent on outside partners. If you're a global freight forwarder, you've got your own network, but traditionally the countries were very autonomous. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that was a big cultural change and business structure change. Uh, so a lot of our efforts in the last years has, has been partnering with the freight forwarders and helping them to on their on their digital uh, journey. Awesome. Well, so let's dive a little bit deeper into the actual report. And you know, we, we've kind of threw some of the results up over here uh, in order to steal the thunder from Judah. One of the things that really, <laughs> you're welcome, Judah. One of the things that really uh, sticks out to me is that while there has been a lot of progress, uh, there's still a lot of a lot of ways to go. Two of the things that, that really stuck out to me the most, between 2015 and, and 2021, the average time to quote for manual quoting is still 51 hours, which is an incredibly long time in, in the business ecosystem, especially when you think about how frequently rates can change. So if I want to ship something today, a 40-foot container you know, could, could go up another $100 or $200 uh, over the course of a couple of days. Certainly air cargo, which is much more volatile and, and where it's, uh, the balance between carrier capacity and pricing changes even more frequently. So, you know, there's certainly a long time to, to go. And, and another kind of thing that sticks out to me is just the price range, where in a more perfect industry, if you're quoting the exact same shipment, an LCL shipment from somewhere in China, let's say to, to Philadelphia, I forgot where exactly we, we were shipping this to, uh, you'd expect the prices to, to roughly converge. Uh, we've seen some years where prices have been over 100%, uh, you know, double uh, different than, than or 200%, I suppose, uh, what, they, what, they, uh, what, what the cheapest price is. We're still seeing a good 35% price range when you get the exact same quote from the top 20 freight forwarders. So we've gone a while, we've gone a ways, but there still is this very, very large gap. Uh, Judah, could you talk through what maybe some of the biggest takeaways from this year's report were? And when you look back, what have been the most fundamental changes where there has been very, very significant progress? And I know you have some couple, a couple of slides here, so feel free to boss me around on, on using them. Sure. So first of all, I would say that just in the, in the last slide that you showed, we said the 51 hours uh, average now, which is much better. Those are for manual quotes. So what we were really looking at are which forwarders can give you an instant quote. So if you factor in the instant quote, then that average would, ju- would drop down to 17 hours. But of course, those are, those are uh, instant quotes are instant. So the average for our manual quote now is, is 51 hours, which is also improved, but really the improvement is, is more than that. Um, yeah, we, so we could jump to the, to the next slide. So uh, like you said, we're, as both of you said, we're definitely seeing steady progress. So if we look at, at the chart here on the left, if we use the ability to offer uh, a quote for uh, an LCL shipment instantly online, um, and we see this kind of as the gold standard in, in digital freight sales because we see digital freight largely for uh, the small shipper. So for, for SMBs who really want a, um, a low touch uh, solution, we can see since 2015 in the, in the dark blue, a steady progress of those uh, forwarders that are able to offer an instant quote for an LCL shipment. Just as an aside, really in the report, we're looking at the, the customer experience aspect of it. So from a, right, as a mystery shopping uh, shipper, um, how easy was it, was it to do this? And, you know, we're convinced of kind of the operational efficiencies that are, that uh, forwarders will benefit from this as well, but we're looking at it kind of from, from the shipper perspective. So um, we can see that about one forwarder per year has added uh, LCL um, uh, capabilities and we see, uh, we see definite progress there. Um, and we're also seeing more modes. So if we look at the kind of the, the table on our right, uh, it's not just LCL, but the, these top forwarders are, uh, are adding uh, FCL or, or air quotes to uh, instant quoting capabilities there as well. So we'll see that this year um, we see DHL and Kudunago both added new modes this year. And we see that now Kudunago, both Kudunago and Agility uh, offer instant quotes in, in all three major modes. Um, but we also see that the progress has been grouped in this, has been concentrated in this group of, of five forwarders. So that's just 25% uh, of, from this list of the top 20 global forwarders who have uh, any instant 
uh, according capabilities. If we uh, jump to the next slide. Um, but these forwarders are also doing more uh, with digital. They're adding more features, ways to make the experience of finding the right solution easier. Um, they're making it easier to search, to sort, to filter, to save quotes, to compare quotes between port pairs or modes, um, to search or sort by transit price, uh, sorry, by, by transit time or, or, or price. Um, for example, agility lets shippers save quotes for later and then regenerate them so they don't have to enter all the details in again uh, if they come back uh, to quote later on. They also offer um, uh, uh, direct to FBA, to, to Amazon warehouses and packaging solutions, which I think is a nod to, to SMB uh, e-commerce importers. Um, DHL, if you ask for a quote in one mode, they'll give you the two other quotes um, uh, alongside for the other, for the other modes. Um, and DB Schenker, if we look on the right, they'll show when you ask for an ocean or you select an ocean quote, they'll show you a kind of a per unit price for all their um, ocean uh, products side by side. Um, and if we look on the left, this example is Kuninagal. They let you save quotes, compare them to other uh, quotes in different modes. They also offer a, a space guarantee when you, when you book online. Uh, others are also offering customs brokerage services or insurance, just lots of uh, different steps to make kind of the whole process easier or a better experience. So, out of, Jude, out of curiosity, has there been any change in how open this is, right? So historically, I think one of the big sources of reluctance for freight forwarders was transparency. Uh, and, and I still remember at a, a TPM conference, the CEO of DB Shanker, this must be three or four years ago, kind of conceding that transparency will happen no matter what. And eventually transparency will become, will become fairly ubiquitous. Do do all freight forwarders still require logins in order to search for freight quotes, or, or do you feel like there's kind of more openness to share rates online uh, without gating them or, or, or forcing, I don't know, somebody within the company to authorize the account? Right. So I say that some offer online quoting without creating an account. Um, most offer online quoting with creating an account, but it's a fairly uh, painless process. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you get immediate access after kind of just entering your, your basic information. So it's not, and there are it's others not that an require verification. It's, it's, it's a computer automatically automated. It's computer. And then there are others, and we say that, see this even more actually with the digital forwarders, which is interesting. And um, we can talk about that more in, in, in a bit, that there's an actual onboarding process where you're, it's required, you know, a, a phone interview or, a, you know, a discussion with a sales representative, uh, which is interesting because that really slows down the scale. Uh, at which you can you can leverage these kinds of these kinds of solutions. Um, I also think that the creating the account also helps the experience because then you have kind of a saved mm -hmm. account where you can go and access your personal quotes and and your history and things like that, which I think would actually makes the experience better. That that's a great uh, great distinction. Though. It's so interesting that the digital forwarders are the ones that are pulling people offline in order to get them onboarded, whereas some of the legacy yeah. forwarders might not be very very interesting. So yeah, moving on, I'll, I'll let you keep on going. Yeah, so that was, uh, you know, what we've talked about so far was kind of the that group of five that have really been responsible for that kind of progress. If we look at the other 15 of the, of the top 20, we're seeing progress as well. So um, 12 of them feature online quoting prominently on their main page. It's very easy to say, you know, get a, get a quote here. And that's compared to one in, in 2018. Um, and there are more and more who have ded dedicated uh, RFQ wizards or kind of an easy form to fill out. Um, then the more standardized the form, the easier it's going to be, the less back and forth there's going to be when actually um, uh, getting a quote, if they have all the right information. Um, almost half of all the forwarders followed up in one way or the other, either with kind of an automated email saying your, you know, your, uh, your request is being processed, or as we said, you know, follow up emails to try and set up a kind of an onboarding call. Um, those that sent quotes by email, this was the, the first year that none of them were received kind of an, in, in the body of an email. So they're kind of an organized PDF, which is also a, kind of a, a customer experience um, plus. So um, I think we're kind of, based on those, we're seeing a growing consensus that digital is a viable uh, sales channel, um, even among the forwarders who ultimately don't have a true low touch capability. So these are, uh, most of these are, are forwarders who aren't able to quote online instantly. Um, as you said before, those who did provide a quote manually, they did it much quicker than, than they used to. I think last year, so you showed 2015, but I think last year it was, the average time was even much longer, several days. Um, as you said, the price variance is, is uh, coming down, which is also better, also a sign of kind of uh, uh, more transparency, um, although there, there is a spread there. 
But if we look on, on the right, those who didn't quote uh, instantly, um, only two of those remaining. So we had four forwarders who, who quoted instantly. Uh, the, of the remaining 16, only two actually ended up providing a quote. So despite the, the follow-up and the emails, mm -hmm. only two actually delivered a quote. So that's 70% of all forwarders that had someone reach out to them, had an interested shipper, didn't ultimately um, uh, uh, return a, a quote, um, which from our perspective, you know, is, is leading, leaving the potential sale on, on the table. And that's um, probably the worst of all worlds because not only are they investing effort in dealing with the initial quote requests, they're not closing it, so it's, it's a net loss. Yeah, exactly. So there's there's definitely an investment being made, but in the end, it's it, it's not a uh, it's not working out. And if we look across all modes, yep. we see only 18 percent uh, of all modes, the top forwarders um, are quoted instantly. And as we said, if you don't quote instantly, it seems much less likely that it's going to you're going to receive a quote at all. Mm -hmm. If we turn now just briefly to what carriers and digital forwarders are doing here, we're talking about ocean carriers. There's much more progress. It's a smaller sample. Um, but we're seeing much more progress. So all the uh, four of the five major ocean carriers now offer instant quotes online with Maersk and MSC adding them this past year. Uh, only Costco of the top five is the, or did not, but they um, have uh, online quoting forms and, and got back within, within two days. And even beyond the top five, there are other ocean carriers who are doing this. Uh, Sim Lines, Evergreen, and Yangmain also have, have instant quoting. Uh, they're also offering, you know, multiple options in, in your search options, multiple sailings, uh, allowing you to, um, you know, to, to kind of get the right uh, solution or the right service that you're looking for. Um, Maersk also offers uh, uh, customs and, and insurance and things like that. And if we yeah. talk about the digital forwarders, as I said, really all of the eight digital forwarders that we looked at, they have instant quoting capabilities. This is for FCL but we only were able to get quotes from three of them because of this onboarding process. So that was interesting to us to see that um, even those, you know, digital first forwarders um, still aren't, have kind of a, more of a sales, uh, a sales team um, uh, approach to, to the acquisition of the, of the client compared to a very low touch uh, solution that we think might be a better fit for, for much smaller shippers. Interesting. Yeah, and and you know, from my side, just a general a general insight that that I that kind of started thinking about a couple of years ago. Instant quoting is really not just about instant quoting. I, I think it, it usually is the tip of the iceberg. In order to quote instantly online, you need to have structured data. You need to have the ability to access that data very quickly. You need to have the piping to connect it to an online sales portal. You need to be able to have that with low latency and be able to provide responses really quickly. So I, I see it less as is it all about the instant quoting and is it actually about, do I have the full tech, full tech stack that can actually support that in order to work up towards there? You know, one question that came in, uh, and thank you, Paulo, uh, that millennials are increasingly coming to decision positions in companies. Uh, what increase uh, do you think there will be on uh, instant quoting over the next uh, three years? And, and Judah, it's the let either, either of you jump in to try to answer that. Yeah, I mean, no, I think it's, it's uh, sorry, I will jump in. Uh, I think it is a definite driver. We've heard this from from different people in the you know in the logistics industry overall. Is that a lot of the demand is going to come from, as you said before, from the customers. Um, and if it's something the customers want, that's going to be a big a big push for the actual providers to uh, to provide it. So I think as that you know generation digital first, uh, digitally native, excuse me, uh, uh, comes of age and comes into these you know um, business decision maker. Uh, positions that it is going to be an impetus uh, for some forwarders, I think, who, who haven't done so until now um, to, to take that jump. Well, Ethan, uh, I've got to jump in and say that I resent the question. Uh, are you, are you not a, a millennial? I, I, I am not a millennial. I know, I I'm not a millennial either. either. My, my kids are millennials. Um, but I resent the implication that us older folk, uh, you know, aren't just as uh, hungry to be served in a modern digital way. Um, so, um, yeah, so of course, millennials is, is a force, um, but a lot of people who are older than that are also, you know, uh, waking up to the fact that there's a modern way of doing business and, and we want to do it the modern way. Yeah. I would, I would even take it one step farther and say that, it, it, you know, 10 years from now, it won't necessarily be the millennials that are looking for instant quotes, but it'll be computer systems like ERPs that will be pulling it in real time at, you know, it's hard to imagine that in 20 or 30 years, anybody will be emailing or logging into a website in order to get a price quote when it could just be an ERP doing a direct booking based off of landed costs. Uh, so, so it's less about appealing to the millennials and more about appealing to their our, uh, computer overlords on this one. Yes. Um, 
So, so moving on, I've spoken about this in a couple of, um, of the previous webinars, but I'm a very strong believer in, in the jobs to be done framework. This is uh, something suggested by Clay Christensen about innovation in general, where when you look at a product, you try to figure out what is the job that somebody is hiring this product to do? One of his fam favorite examples is about uh, a fast food chain that served milkshakes. And what, what he basically found was that what people were usually hiring their milkshake to do is to keep them full while they were commuting, where it was a little bit better than a soft drink, a little bit more filling, something that they could sip a little bit slowly. And the fast food restaurant chain was able to shift over towards messaging more towards commuters, creating more sales at the right time for commuters in order to appease to them, but recognizing that the milkshake wasn't necessarily for their children, but was something that was being hired in order to keep them full and satiated while they were commuting. Uh, and and I, I think that's a really interesting perspective, if I do say so myself, for, uh, for an online uh, quoting solution. Like Judah, uh, for you, what is the actual job that uh, customers are hiring their freight for forwarder portals to do? Or conversely, from the freight forwarder perspective, what is the job that they're putting their websites out towards their customers in order to fill? Right. So, so I, I think as you're um, as you're getting at digital sales isn't the only way to digitize or isn't the only way to leverage digital tools to to improve processes, processes uh, and improve service for for your customers. And I think the fact that you know we only have this group of five who are making this this progress over the last few years. Um, doesn't mean that the rest of the industry are doing exactly what they did, you know, in 1998. Um, I, you know, I think we've seen, and as we're just talking about kind of the, the generational divide between customers, there are different types of, of freight customers, right? There there's, seems to be a stratification. There are those that prefer the kind of the, the long, uh, the longer cycle relationship-based um, uh, sales. And these might be sometimes the, the larger shippers. And there are those who really want a lower touch um, uh, sales and, and, you know, booking situation as we have in, in, a, in a lot of other areas. So um, I think there is that kind of stratification. I think as we said at the outset, there might be some cultural inertia for some, for some of the forwarders that it's, it's a, a big change to how business is done and, and requires kind of a, a reshuffling of some, uh, uh, of some operations and the way things are done. But as I said, those that aren't doing so uh, doesn't mean they're not Leveraging digital tools. So interestingly, if we looked at you know the number of forwarders who have um, who have RFQ or you know request an online an online quote on their main page, um, some of them do, but almost all of them have track and trace. So for existing customers, we see that all, nearly all of these top forwarders are investing in the ability to track your your shipment and to do it easily on on their main page. And I think just as um, uh, the other the the other ways that uh, that forwarders who aren't necessarily doing digital sales um, are are improving the experience for their existing customers is through other digital things like um, syncing to TMS, uh, predictive analytics, uh, things like integrating address books or credit management and things like this. There, there's other ways that that um, digital tools can be used, and just because a forwarder is not uh, does not have uh, online customer facing. Uh, digital sales doesn't mean that they're not trying to uh, improve the experience in other ways digitally. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, for, for another stroll down memory lane, uh, there's a list here of the top global freight forwarders uh, back in 2011 and the top global freight forwarders right now. And, and of course, there's been mergers, acquisitions, a little bit of reshuffling. Uh, and, and of course, the, the top global freight forwarders of today are, are now increasingly competing with companies like Maersk, maybe Amazon, right? right. A, lot, a lot of things have changed over the past 10 years. Uh, back in 2011, Amazon wasn't even registered as a freight forwarder. And, and now uh, if you've subscribed to our uh, monthly logistics technology uh, newsletter, you'll have seen that uh, their Amazon Global Mile department is hiring for over a hundred different roles. So a, a lot has really changed over the past uh, 10 years or so. And I guess Svi, uh, to you, what do you think will be fundamentally different about freight in 10 years from now, right? So from take that 10 year shift that we just talked about and like take it a little bit forward, what do you feel like will be the most uh, fundamental shift that has occurred since then? Yeah, I mean, I think a few, I think a few things, you know, the, the one which uh, we've sort of focused on so far today is the instant transparent pricing. Um, so it's great to see that there's progress with that, that there are more forwarders and, and, and carriers who are giving an instant, digital price, which is great. 
Um, I think there's got to be a lot more than that still. I mean, as, as uh, Judah said, uh, still 15 of the top 20 freight forwarders can't do that at all. Um, and then there's a big big spread. So some of them are giving a, giving a price very quickly, but it's a lousy price, which no one's going to pay. So that, that's not much useful either. Uh, I think the second thing, which is very, very important, is that the quotes and the service in general should be binding. So I believe that uh, virtually every quote that uh, that we received said in the small print subject to GRI, subject to general you know, rate increase. Um, that's that's still the norm in the industry. Um, and, and, and that's kind of insane. You know, it's like going to a restaurant and, and they give you a menu and then it says at the bottom that, you know, by the time you finish your meal, all, all the prices may have changed. So, so there's not much point having a quote if, if, if it's not, doesn't match what you're invoiced afterwards, you know. Um, so I think that's a major um, area where, where the quotes will be not just instant, but also binding. Um, and binding is both ways. You know, binding means also that the shipper has to commit um, to actually show up with a container. So there should be penalties for the shippers who don't show up. There should be penalties for the, for the carriers. And, and neither side should be able to just change the price because, because they feel like it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's, a, you know, the... the very basic thing. I mean, this is a very basic thing in any business is a binding contract where both sides know what they're getting into. They know what the service is going to be given. They know what they're going to pay. So that, that's a very, very important area. Uh, and another thing which is very clear, and it, it's been accelerated by COVID, is uh, is that prices will become more real-time. You know, carriers will be updating their prices on a daily basis, on an hourly basis. This is particularly dramatic in air, um, which is not our main topic today, but um, airlines used to, before COVID, often had a, a price which was valid for six months, you know, and now things are changing so quickly, that's just ridiculous. So, so more and more are moving to, to dynamic prices, and we're partnering with a lot of airlines on that. Um, a big aspect of that is what we're doing, I think, with the with our indexes, our FBX, our, our index, our, the Freight of Baltic Index for container shipping, does let everyone know what is the market price day by day. And and that's a fantastic resource that people can use to make sure that they're quoting competitively. Um, and and it turns out, you know, you, you mentioned before that the only, it's not necessarily the case that the only way to give a, a digital binding quote is if you've got real time connections to the, to the carriers. I mean, that's ideal, but you can also do what every other industry does now and and do it based on an algorithm, um, and without even having a binding quote from the carrier, you can receive data from from freighters for example where you know what is the what is the market rate and quote based on that in the confidence mm-hmm. that that will closely match what you actually get in practice okay, so yeah. i think those you know that's what i'd sum up the the instant quotes the binding quotes and the dynamic pricing interesting all right thanks um you know before we move on to the the last couple of questions just to wrap up uh david asked earlier on and has been waiting patiently um, maybe this is best for Tzvi. How is it that door-to-door air freight instant rates uh, working is still so difficult? Like that it's so difficult to get destination charges in every country unless you're a large freight forwarder. Uh, do you have any, any perspective on, on why it's so cumbersome and what's changing about that? Well, it's cumbersome because there are many countries and, uh, you know, each one has its own trucking companies and, and um, uh just America has tens of thousands of trucking companies, right? The the average trucking company in America has three trucks, uh, and it's similar in many other countries. So trucking is just so fragmented, e- even more than air and ocean. Uh, no standards, uh, so so that makes it hard. It makes it hard to have a binding quote. And then, you know, there's a difference between origin uh, trucking and destination ch- uh, trucking, or the pre carriage and the on carriage. The so pre carriage, if you can connect to the trucker with an API that then it's easy enough, but, but for the destination that that's in ocean, that may be 30 days from now. Right. So nobody's going to give you a binding quote for 30 days in, in, in a volatile market. Um, so, so those are the two reasons, you know, you've got many countries, a lot of fragmentation and you've got the on carriage is actually somewhere into the future. Uh, but, but like with everything in today's world, the solution to all of that is data. You don't, you don't necessarily, need to book the truck now because you don't know, you know, for the on carriage, because you don't know exactly when the ship would arrive. Uh, but there's plenty of data out there. We have data and freight waves and their partners have a lot of data for trucking. And you can quote based on an estimate of what the trucking cost will be. And, and we have a lot of benchmark data on that and other people do too. 
And, um, you know, that way, sometimes you win a bit, sometimes you lose a bit, but there's plenty of data available to, to you know, make a, a valid guess and quote based on that. Awesome. So, so just to wrap up with a couple of very quick questions uh, that we had submitted. Uh, question about Amazon creating a monopoly. Uh, maybe, Tzvi, I'll, I'll ask you this question, but, but uh, change it a, a slightly of, of what role do you feel or anticipate Amazon will be playing in, in the global freight space over the next couple of years? <laughs> well, wouldn't we all like to know that? Um, but yeah, I mean, Amazon Amazon is a fascinating company and, and we've written about it before, you know. Um, and, I, I, you know, monopoly is a very dramatic word, but, but if you look at US retail and some other countries, you know, uh, Prime is now in the majority of households and a big majority of the higher income households. So, uh, you know, in terms of having a um, subscription relationship for regular e-commerce, Amazon is pretty damn close to a monopoly and having a majority of the market on their platform. Um, and so that then does absolutely, um, you know, carry on to other things. So then Amazon say, okay, now if you want to sell to the majority of American households who have Prime, in most cases, the only way to do that is to put your um, goods as a seller in, in the Amazon warehouses. Mm -hmm. So suddenly, almost the only way to sell to all of these prime subscribers, which is most of the American market, the, the only and, and similar in UK and other places, virtually, virtually the only way to sell to the majority of households who've got prime and want to use prime is to put your goods to use the Amazon warehousing. So now they've got a, a real advantage in logistics. <clears throat> and now they're getting into trucking and air, and presumably there'll they'll be that connection again where you know, the only way to, or the preferred way perhaps to get your stuff into the Amazon warehouse or out of the Amazon warehouse is you using Amazon Logistics. So uh, I don't know exactly what they're, they're, they're you know, going to be doing. They've already made aggressive moves into trucking, into air, into, into ocean forwarding. Um, but whatever they do, it will probably be tied to fulfilled by Amazon and fulfilled mm -hmm. by Amazon is tied to Prime. And so it's, so they will have a, an inherent, inherent advantage there. Mm -hmm. All right, and very important follow-up question to that. What is your favorite pizza topping to me? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, mushrooms and onions, very very hard to choose between them. Right. I, I do like to have both where possible. Perfect. Judah? Yeah, I also actually love mushrooms. Uh, if right. you do onions on there, that's good too. But any, any kind of mushroom, fresh, or even like the slimy ones from the can, uh, I'll take them. <laughs> <laughs> You're making me hungry. Um, N next question um, coming up. Uh, sorry, this is now moving there. Um, I guess, J Judah, this might be a little bit more for you uh, just because you're following the ocean, ocean market so closely. What do you feel are the factors at play in returning rates to normal baselines? Yeah, so the, the main thing that's driven rates so high um, really since, you know, um, September uh, and, and even more so um, from, from Asia to Europe has been this shift in consumer uh, habits. So as everyone's been at home, we've shifted from spending on services like travel and entertainment and restaurants to spending on goods. So the main thing that's gonna bring rates down is uh, if demand starts to subside. And that's really only gonna happen once um, or if consumer spending goes back to, to their normal habits, um, which likely won't happen until the pandemic is really under control in some of these major economies. So that's that's the first thing. Um, the, the other thing is, uh, it, is kind of the, the new power that carriers have. So the carriers have gotten much better at being able to match, um, uh, capacity to, to demand. And that's something that could keep rates, um, more elevated than, than they normally would be as demand falls. So that's the other thing. That's kind of the other major factor, but it's the, it's the demand side. That's really, um, mm -hmm. for now keeping rates up. Great. And, and last question, just to end with, because I know that we're, we're just at the end of our time. Uh, what do you feel like COVID has changed for online freight sales? So for, for you know, for the Freightos marketplace, but also for the forwarders that we've spoken to um, who are selling online, they all said that it's really accelerated uh, adoption um, to, to the way, you know, kind of to the pace at which it was growing uh, prior to the pandemic. And I think that's because, uh, you know, as there was so much more volatility and people working from home, it was just for businesses that hadn't thought of uh, using that option before and now became a viable option. And we've heard that from other, um, you know, from carriers as well. Um, I think Air France, KLM, we had a chance to, to speak to them and they had a big jump 
uh, in adoption over over the course of the pandemic. So I think as as uh, COVID has really accelerated, you know, e-commerce and a lot of shifts to digitization, different types of digitization in many different industries and, and types of businesses. I think that's also something that's uh, impacted online freight sales for those who who already offer it. And it may be um, kind of a catalyst for for other forwarders who are in the process or are considering it um, to kind of uh, expedite that process now. Awesome. Uh, all right. Well, uh, th- that's just about our, our time right now. It's V, uh, Judah, thank you so much for your time and, and for joining. It was fun to have uh, Thanks, a Judah. home audience. Thanks, um, and and I, I did say there'd be a disclaimer before I say anything that's vaguely promotional. Uh, of, of course, we do work with, with uh, over 2,000 global freight forwarders, uh, helping them with internal freight rate management, online sales solutions, and API integrations, and of course, integration directly to carriers. Uh, that's done by our web cargo business unit. So if you're a freight forwarder that wants to play in this space, uh, head over to webcargo.co. You could learn a little bit more and download some more research. We also have another research uh, report coming out in the next couple of weeks about the market sizing of small and mid-sized importers. So if that's interesting for you, uh, keep a lookout for our, our emails. Uh, our next Future Freight episode will be on uh, March 24th. We'll be hosting uh, the CEO or the head of strategy at a large LCL consolidator to dive deep on what have been the changes in the LCL market, the, the specific dynamics related to COVID and, and how LCL will be changing, digitizing and adopting over the next couple of years. So thanks again for your time. Uh, thanks to Svi, thanks Judah, thanks everybody who attended and we'll see you next time.